the panelist can unmute themselves and uh, we will have the session yes so i hope the slides are full screen now so so again my pleasure and honor to welcome you all to this 167th edition of thursday musings uh, everyone is on the mute mode the panelists can will uh, unmute themselves and uh, we'll have the discussion the questions will be invited in the chat box the moderators will take it up to the uh, presenter so the topic of today is super sensitivity psychosis what are its clinical implications a very learned speaker today with us to and with two very learned chairpersons i am handing over the session to professor dr tofan pati sir sir is from katak is the chair of this program and if sir allows i can skip your cv sir thank you very much uh, we must start in time and i have the initial responsibility to introduce our parent moderators i shall introduce them with a single line dr abhijit patel who will be joining soon and he is he has been in the from the very beginning very outset of this program is professor of psychiatry in high tech medical college and currently president of odisha state branch and secretary of western general branch and dr alim siddiqui professor of psychiatry in lucknow's era eras medical college lucknow and incumbent treasurer of indian psychiatric society all the treasury is in hands welcome both the moderators next thank slide you. please thank you our chief person dr sukanto sarkar currently working as additional professor in the department of psychiatry ems kalyani since december 2020 a former professor of psychiatry of mahatma gandhi medical college and research institute puducherry sbv university deemed to be university and he has a graduate medical graduate from ardikar medical college kolkata and dpm md from cip ranchi he is pg diploma in health professional education he got it in 2017 and the gold medal list He has thirty-five publications to his credit, both in national and international peer-reviewed journals. The reviewer of the following journals: National Medical Journal of India, The World Journal of Biology and Psychiatry, Journal of Sleep Disorders and Management, Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and Mental Health, Asian Journal of Psychiatry, Indian Journal of Psychiatry, Guides and Co-Guides of various MD-PhD students and students in different disciplines, Achievements, Lilavati Vishwanath Award, two thousand eight. Best poster and best award by faculty at SBV Research Week 2016. Awarded first place in the SBV Research Week faculty podium competition 2017. Got approval of an ICMR ad hoc extramural funded project in April 2020. Approved is 20 lakhs approximately as principal investigator and co PL for the two ICMR projects. Organizing secretary for various state level, national level, national level conferences. guest speaker and invited speaker in various conferences and cme program with this we have with us dr sukant sarkar a leader a organizer and an academic chair welcome dr sukant the next you, person sir. the next chair person with us is please give the proceed on to the next slide dr adin next slide please dr bishwarendran mishra is professor of psychiatry in aims bhubaneswar areas of interest involve severe mental illness organic psychiatry psychopharmacology and neuromodulation following up a cohort of more than 2000 persons with the development of neuropsychiatry in such aims bhubaneswar he has about 71 publications and age index is 15 and 1 to 2 is 22 he has got many years awards and honors fellow of the royal college of physicians in glasgow in 2022 Pune Psychiatric Association Award in 1923, Best Poster Award in Icons of Scott in 2021, Late Professor J C Burrell Memorial Award in 2021, Late Professor Dr Mivadas Memorial Award in 2019, M N M S of in 2016, and Dr Amit Bora Memorial Gold Medal in DP in 2004. Welcome, Dr Vishwanath Mishra. And with this, Thank I hand over the further proceedings to our. 
chairpersons, quite academically oriented, and their inputs will be very nice, very much enriching. Over to you, the chairpersons. Please take over. Thank you, sir. Uh, I will start with uh, with first introducing our speaker. And I think I am honored and privileged to introduce a great person, a very learned person, Dr. G. Venkat Subramaniam, sir, Professor of Psychiatry at Nimhans. Uh, sir, uh, needs no introduction, but still it's customary to uh, introduce, sir. So, uh, sir has a very great understanding about severe mental disorder and schizophrenia. And uh, please, uh, the slide has gone. Right. Uh, and uh, Sir has done, uh, done a lot of research in clinical neurobiology of schizophrenia, including brain imaging studies, neuroimmunology, neurometabolism. And also Sir is uh, uh, leads a specialized clinical research service for schizophrenia, also known as INSTAR program at NIMHANS. Uh, another interesting area of Sir is neuromodulatory intervention in psychiatry, and he leads the weak intensity, uh, intensity stimulation for enhancement and reintegration, WISER neuromodulation program at NIMHANS, which implements clinical and neurobiological research studies on transcranial electrical stimulation techniques in psychiatry, which is, I think, one of the uh, modern techniques, treatment of uh, mental disorders. Sir has over 400 research publications and recognized with several awards. Sir is a fellow of National Science uh, Academics as well as National Academy of Medical Sciences, FAMS of India. The Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, the Apex Agency of Government of India for Scientific Research, awarded Sir Shanti Swaru Bhatnagar Prize for Science and Technology, one of the highest Indian science awards for his contribution to medical science in 2018. So with this uh, brief uh, introduction of Sir, I think uh, we will be very honored to listen to you and uh, clarify our doubts in a very interesting topic that uh, today we are discussing. And I think very rare also because we don't discuss this kind of topic and people think that these are of old school of psychiatry. Uh, we uh, learn all this in a newer school. I think textbooks, uh, I don't know whether it still persists in that level. So uh, with this uh, brief introduction, I request uh, Dr. Vishwaranjan Mishra to take over and uh, make his comments and then sir can take over the stage. Thank you. Good evening uh, to all of you and uh, uh, Thanks uh, to Dr. Sukanta Sarkar. And it's my privilege actually to uh, chair this uh, wonderful session by uh, uh, a session by a very learned person, uh, a person of great repute. Uh, so it's uh, as a part of a duty, I, I, I'll have to just briefly mention briefly the understanding of the topic uh, regarding supersensitive psychosis. It's a it, it's a rare condition uh, uh, actually that is seen uh, among patients with chronic psychosis uh, who are on long-term antipsychotics. And uh, eventually, <clears throat> patients who are on stable uh, antipsychotics for a prolonged period of time, uh, they eventually develop uh, dopamine supersensitivity, and uh, which uh, has a variable expression. Uh, like uh, it, uh, the expression can be... Uh, in terms of increased uh, dopamine levels uh, in the mesolimbic pathway producing uh, rebound psychosis and its expression in the motor tracts uh, manifesting in terms of tardive phenomenon. So these are a very interesting phenomenon which we incur in the day-to-day -day practice. Eventually, we cannot understand why actually somebody who has been on a chronic antipsychotic with good compliance suddenly throws an episode of rebound psychosis. Uh, uh, there were few interesting cases uh, also we had incurred in our practice in the last five years, uh, patients with similar kind of presentation. And uh, notably, uh, after that, only we start, st started to think about the, the possibilities and then uh, our interest grew. And uh, uh, Sir might be knowing that uh, uh, Sriraj and me, uh, we were uh, working on this uh, particular 10 patients and uh, we had similar kind of presentations. Uh, so, this is a clinical challenge uh, adding to treatment resistance. Uh, so, there is a need to understand the phenomenology, the expression and the treatment challenges uh, we incur uh, in context of tardive psychosis or supersensitive psychosis. With these words, I would request um, uh, Professor Venkat, sir, to please uh, start the 
sessions. We are eager to listen to you, sir. Thank you. Sir, I'm just sharing my screen. Is it uh, visible? Yes, sir. Yes. In the screen show mode. So, um, good evening all, and uh, I'm quite uh, 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 honored to be a part of this uh, Musings uh, series, and uh, I, I was quite uh, impressed to see that uh, today is the 167th session that is commendable, and uh, uh, you know, I would like to thank Dr. Alim Siddiqui for this opportunity. And when he shared the outline of uh, this Musings program, uh, I was quite uh, um, interested uh, with, with respect to the kind of outline that he has mentioned. Um, uh, so, so that is something which, uh, will, uh, which has made me to make this uh, presentation in, in a way uh, to share some of uh, the contemporary literature and to interact and learn from uh, several uh, of the experienced psychiatrists and learned colleagues here. And uh, to begin, I would like to thank, along with uh, Dr. Alim, Dr. Topan Pati, sir, as well as uh, Dr. Sukanto Sarkar and uh, Dr. Mishra. Dr. Sukanto, thanks for your uh, generous uh, introduction and uh, Dr. Mishra for, for uh, the apt uh, introduction. Um, you know, as I'm aware of uh, the work that uh, you have done along with my colleague Sriraj uh, in this area of supersensitivity psychosis. So the title of my presentation is Supersensitivity Psychosis and Clinical Implications in the Treatment of Schizophrenia. So when, when Dr. Ali mentioned about a topic that should have a clinical relevance, which has not been uh, kind of discussed recently, um, I thought I would suggest this and uh, thanks for you know, accepting this uh, proposal and uh, offering me an opportunity to um, present and uh, learn through the interactions, uh, Dr. Ali. Now, uh, if you look at uh, the uh, super sensitivity psychosis, you know, uh, and if you look at the literature that uh, has been uh, available, uh, especially in the last decade or so, uh, one would see uh, increasing interest in this area. And another reason for re-emergence of this concept uh, can be summarized by uh, this nice title of an editorial published by Dr. McGorry in JAMA Psychiatry about a decade before. So the title goes by this, Anti-Psychotic Medication During the Critical Period fol Following Remission from First Episode Psychosis. Less is more, uh, indicating lesser the dose, more is the benefit. If you look at the background of this uh, particular editorial, so this comes from uh, a study that was published in that uh, issue of uh, the JAMA Psychiatry, uh, which, which talks about uh, what is the status and our learnings uh, with respect to treating people with uh, schizophrenia, especially after the acute uh, phase of symptoms are controlled. So this is a major question. There are, there are several uh, components to this question. Uh, number one, when we treat people with schizophrenia and their symptoms improve and they achieve a remission, uh, what should we do with respect to the dose of the antipsychotic medication, uh, with respect to the duration of uh, treatment that is required, whether we should stick to the same antipsychotic that we used for the acute control of symptoms or should we shift to a different molecule? So there are numerous questions. One specific aspect that was addressed by this study, which was led by Dr. Undernik, is that if we reduce the dose of antipsychotic, um, especially in the early stages of treating people that have first episode psychosis, and if we follow them up for a longer period, say here in, in this study, they have looked at up to seven years, the people that uh, were treated with reduced dose of antipsychotics, they showed superior longer term recovery compared with the rates that are achieved with the maintenance treatment. As we all are aware, maintenance treatment is the standard recommendation uh, for 
the longer term treatment of schizophrenia. So this uh, specific publication created a lot of interest. There were uh, provocative views which even uh, suggested whether by over treating people with schizophrenia, whether we are doing more harm than good. And in that context, there was a mention about possible dopamine supersensitivity influencing the findings of this impressive work. So in this background, I'll just uh, introduce uh, the schizophrenia, as we all know, is a debilitating condition. And it is perhaps the most disabling disease. Uh, one would be uh, interested to see this Lancet data, which says that perhaps this is the disease that can be called as the most disabling with the maximum disability weight among all the medical conditions. Now, if you look at the onset and the evolution of uh, schizophrenia, we know that there is a gene versus environmental interaction starting from the prenatal stages. And what is uh, specifically relevant for today's presentation is the kind of course uh, that a typical uh, person with schizophrenia uh, demonstrates. You know, there is this kind of uh, uh, remission and recovery or fluctuating severity of the symptoms and in the long run it is getting into a relapsing and remitting course and of course which is characterized by heterogeneous groups of symptoms and there are also uh, current neurobiological uh, changes which have been mapped to different of these uh, stages and I, I wouldn't be getting into the neurobiological aspects, but the reason I thought I should mention this slide is, uh, as we see, there is a green oval, which is here in this clinical neurobiological trajectory, which is suggested to be the window, which is in the early course of schizophrenia, where there is an opportunity for us to decrease the transition from um, a more debilitating course towards a more favorable outcome. So, so I'll, I'll be alluding to some of these things in the context of uh, dopamine sens supersensitivity in the coming slides. Now, what is the clinical significance of uh, dopamine supersensitivity? Now, there are uh, quite radical views, like there are views about dopamine supersensitivity which is seen as a very uh, rare phenomena versus there are certain views which suggest that it is much, much more common than what we think. Uh, to make a, a kind of a clinical approach discussion, I would uh, be uh, primarily looking at the views that suggest dopamine supersensitivity as a clinically significant phenomena and the kind of literature related to that Perhaps this is something which we can debate and critique uh, in the discussion uh, section. Now, with respect to antipsychotics, we know that they are the mainstay treatment and we are yet to uh, discover a mode to treat schizophrenia without antipsychotic. Although antipsychotics are efficacious in the short-term intervention in most patients, chronic antipsychotic treatment is characterized by high rates of uh, relapses. Now, there's quite a bit of uh, controversy. Uh, if we look into the neurobiology of it, especially the clinical neurobiology, whether the relapsing and remitting course in majority of patients with schizophrenia, whether it is an inherent part of the illness or there is an insinuating effect of the treatment especially the dopamine antagonism that we introduce to modify this clinical condition. So that's that's the crux of uh, the pro versus con of uh, the uh, dopamine supersensitivity phenomenon. Now, this is a text which I have uh, taken from one of the publications that appeared in Molecular Psychiatry, where the authors have summarized several related literature and then mentioned this in the introductory section of their manuscript that around 39%, that is out of 70 to 80% of the relapsing uh, and remitting patients with psychosis, around 39% of these cases can 
result from antipsychotic induced dopamine supersensitivity, which they also call as behavioral supersensitivity, and which is characterized by the therapeutic uh, efficacy and the emergence of motor side effects, uh, which uh, Dr. Mishra alluded to in the while introducing the topic. So once this kind of behavioral supersensitivity occurs, it often motivates the patient to reduce or abstain from antipsychotic intake because of uh, the intolerance uh, by itself, especially the motor side effect and sometimes significant dysphoria, and which in turn uh, leads to a kind of a spiraling negativistic impact on the course, and uh, which perhaps is postulated to underlie the emergence of uh, treatment resistance, especially uh, co-occurring with tardive dyskinesia. So if you look at some of the proponents of uh, dopamine uh, supersensitivity, uh, the, the key uh, researcher being Dr. Choinat, uh, he summarizes the prevalence of uh, dopamine supersensitivity could be as high as about 30% of all schizophrenia patients that we treat. And more strikingly, he claims that up to 70% of treatment-resistant schizophrenia patients, there could be the component of dopamine supersensitivity that uh, influences the clinical presentation. So that is a baffling figure. So while we talk about uh, the dopamine supersensitivity as an important clinical phenomena, it is also pertinent and important to refresh the link between dopamine and many of the clinical manifestations of schizophrenia. That there are several neurotransmitters that have been implicated in the pathogenesis of schizophrenia, but we are yet to have a widely applied treatment molecule that does not involve dopamine antagonism. Of course, we have the first of non-dopamine clinically effective molecule uh, to an extent by Mavan Serin, but it is still early uh, stage and we need to wait for longer time to see its uh, clinical uh, efficacy in the broader spectrum of patients. Now, coming to the link between uh, the neurotransmitter abnormalities and clinical manifestations of schizophrenia, this is a slide which nicely summarizes how dopamine abnormalities can be linked to various symptom manifestations. The consensus that uh, has been kind of agreed or is emerging across uh, several of the research leads is that the problem perhaps lies with the GABA neurons. And there are two levels of glutamatergic neurons. When the first, le first level glutamatergic neuron fires without uh, the GABA neuron firing, the second order glutamatergic neuron gets into a hyper stimulation mode. So which basically has a differential impact on the dopamine neurons in the midbrain. You know? So what, what happens here is uh, in, in synopsis, like for example, here, this is a direct synapse where the glutamatergic uh, neuron uh, stimulates the dopaminergic neuron directly so that there is a hyper dopaminergic state in the mesolimbic uh, system. So the limbic hyperactivity in the context of uh, super sensitivity is something again Dr. Mishra alluded to. So this is something which is uh, uh, a part of the pathogenesis of schizophrenia that is hyper transmitting mesolimbic dopaminergic signaling. So this is believed to underlie the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. And with respect to the second group of neurons, that is second group of uh, dopaminergic neuron, that is mesocortical, there is a GABA interneuron which is excessively firing. So there is a reduction of uh, signaling here, which underlies the negative symptoms. So today the focus of our discussion will be primarily on the positive symptoms, especially what happens to the mesolimbic hyperactivity in the context of a, a presentation which suggests dopamine supersensitivity. Now, if we look further, uh, several of the phenotypic manifestations of schizophrenia, whether it is reality distortion or cognitive impairment and certain other 
subtle neurobiological abnormalities like uh, stress uh, dysregulation, uh, especially involving cortisol, all of them could be linked through the cellular and circuitry basis, which I summarized in the previous slide. I'm, I'm just putting these two slides essentially to reiterate the centrality of dopamine in terms of its close connect with various clinical manifestations of schizophrenia, which again should make us to think about dopamine hypersensitivity or dopamine supersensitivity in a much more critical way. So, this kind of uh, dysregulation leads to uh, what is called as uh, an aberrant salient uh, that is related to hippocampal volume deficits. Uh, we have reported hippocampal volume deficits in uh, the schizophrenia cohort uh, from Nimhans. Now, in, in hyperdopaminergic aberrant salient condition, um, we know that uh, the hippocampus, which is critically involved in the context-dependent uh, processing will shift into what is called as a highly activating mode. And uh, in settings that are highly activating, uh, if it has to happen in a normal way, uh, the ventral hippocampus will be looking at uh, any threat in the environment. Say, for example, if I am crossing the road, I have to get into a high alert mode. On the other hand, in a benign environment, like uh, giving a talk here, of course, in the later part, we may be getting tougher questions. Maybe at the time I have to become more alert, but right now I would think it is relatively benign. So my ventral hippocampus would tone down the dopamine response. Whereas if this ventral uh, hippocampus is pathologically in a constantly high activity state, this dopamine system would always be driven to respond maximally to all stimuli that I encounter. And such a situation could lead to attribution of strong behavioral importance to stimuli that otherwise would be safely ignored. So perhaps this kind of um, uh, thinking uh, underlies the morbidity of several uh, clinical symptoms uh, that we encounter in people with schizophrenia. So this is aberrant salience. The reason I thought I will mention about aberrant salience is because of its critical connect with the dopamine, number one. Number two, in supersensitivity, these are the kinds of pathways which become much more hypertransmitting than during the pathogenetic state. So this is uh, the uh, uh, schema that I have uh, uh, taken from uh, Dr. Gray's paper, which again summarizes how uh, dopamine is a key component of uh, this whole circuit. Now, moving on from the neurobiology towards uh, the clinical uh, link, uh, there are numerous studies that have emphasized uh, the link between dopamine D2 receptor occupancy and clinical improvement in schizophrenia. Like uh, there is a very nice link uh, between D2 receptor occupancy and the reduction in symptom scores. And through several of these PET studies as well as PET studies based evidence, uh, there is convincing a lead to consider the importance of D2 antagonism in amelioration of especially the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. And there are also uh, nice literature that suggests that perhaps uh, this particular blockade of D2 receptor uh, can be something which has a good potential towards a biomarker for treatment response prediction. But at the same time, the question which is relevant to the dopamine supersensitivity is if we block these receptors more than what is required, uh, what may happen? So that is the basis for dopamine supersensitivity. Uh, and we also know that when we treat people with uh, schizophrenia, there is a substantial uh, proportion which do not respond to antipsychotic medications. So uh, this uh, group of treatment resistant uh, patients can be of different uh, subgroups. I'll, I'll be alluding to it. Uh, but what is equally important is treatment resistance in schizophrenia contributes to 80% of uh, healthcare cost burden. So this is something which is critical when we look at the schizophrenia. Now, when we see treatment resistance and its link with dopamine supersensitivity, uh, 
uh, in our clinical experience, we would have seen uh, patients that present with treatment resistance with different types of trajectories. There are certain people who may be having resistance right from the initial stages of treatment, starting from the first antipsychotic. So that is one group. There's also another group where we see that when we treat them with uh, the antipsychotic for the first time, they respond very well. And uh, sometime later, either because of uh, non-adherence or sometimes even on regular treatment, they may present with a breakthrough episode. We treat them. Many a time the relapse, as we know, uh, requires higher dose than what was required in the initial uh, stage of the illness. So as we keep treating episode by episode, over the course of time, the person becomes treatment resistant uh, to at least two or more number of antipsychotics and then we consider close pain. So now uh, if you look at uh, the studies that have looked at the trajectory of uh, the treatment resistant patients, uh, majority of treatment resistant patients uh, that go towards uh, clozapine treatment, they have early resistant. Whereas about 30% of treatment resistant patients uh, where there is a response to antipsychotic, they attain symptomatic uh, remission, but at a later stage, they fail to respond to the ongoing use of non-clozapine antipsychotic. So this is the breakup. And if you look at uh, Dr. Chinat's claim, uh, as much as of 70% uh, of treatment resistant schizophrenia patients may have uh, uh, dopamine supersensitivity. So this, this is where it gets kind of uh, linked with the treatment resistance, which is an important clinical challenge in our day-to-day -day practice. So, in, so coming to uh, dopamine supersensitivity psychosis, the concept originated with the reports by uh, Dr. Chinard and colleagues, like it is about uh, in the 1970s. And in, in their cohort, they observed patients whose psychotic symptoms worsened immediately upon cessation of treatment. And after that, even higher doses of medications uh, were found to be needed, sometimes without much benefit, to control the patient's psychosis. And in the course of time, they observed tardive dyskinesia in these uh, patients. Now, when we think about dopamine uh, supersensitivity, we are also uh, uh, sensitized towards uh, the need for uh, awareness about what are called as anti-psychotic withdrawal symptoms. Uh, you know, so th this has to be kind of um, uh, dissected out and contrasted with the possibility of uh, dopamine supersensitivity versus just. Uh, um, antipsychotic withdrawal state so which uh, which may involve like when when we are reducing the dose of antipsychotic or switching an antipsychotic from one molecule to other there could be withdrawal symptoms which may involve cholinergic uh, profile you know, as we could see it may involve agitation insomnia and uh, several of the other cholinergic withdrawal uh, features that could be dopaminergic withdrawal symptoms. So here there could be withdrawal dyskinesia. So this is the, the group of symptoms which may come closer to supersensitivity psychosis. But as we see here, these withdrawal symptoms, they do not have uh, the component of psychosis. And we may have serotonin withdrawal symptoms, histaminergic withdrawal symptoms. And if we are looking at dopaminergic withdrawal symptoms, so this is something which sometimes could be short lasting, in which case they uh, qualify for withdrawal symptoms. But if they are persistent, this is the context in which we will think about the possibility of uh, supersensitivity psychosis. So what happens in uh, dopamine supersensitivity uh, condition? So what we see here in this cartoon in the upper half is the depiction of the normal dopamine activity. And when we treat uh, people with uh, uh, D2 antagonists, the dopamine D2 receptor density increases. Now, there are more number of receptors in the postsynaptic neuron compared to what we see in the upper half of the panel. So, which means there is a possibility of increased dopamine activity. So, this is the depiction of what happens in dopamine supersensitivity. So excessive blockade of D2 receptor leads to increased D2 receptor density. 
There are also proposals that suggest after excessive D2 blockade, the profile of D2 receptor changes. It becomes a high affinity receptor. So this is an area which has mixed evidence, the, the D2 high affinity uh, receptor. Now coming to the clinical uh, criteria that define uh, dopamine supersensitivity psychosis is when a patient with schizophrenia uh, has been treated with uh, continuous antipsychotic for about at least three months or more. So there has to be three important components. The first is the presence of rebound psychosis. That is a psychotic relapse that occurs immediately after the reduction, cessation, or change of antipsychotics. Um, so they have given a kind of definition about this um, immediacy. That is within six weeks of oral agents and or within three months for the depot uh, antipsychotics. The second component is a tolerance to the antipsychotic effect is observed. That is, when severe psychotic symptoms or related uh, positive symptoms emerge, a higher dose of antipsychotic is needed to control the psychotic symptoms compared to the dose of previous treatment. And there are occasions where we may come across even a high dose treatment cannot control the psychosis. And then the presence or the history of tardive dyskinesia. So these are three important components to uh, identify the possibility of dopamine supersensitivity psychosis. So what actually happens if you look at the trajectory of the evolution of dopamine supersensitivity? As we treat uh, people with antipsychotics in the early stage, the hyperdopaminergia, which I showed as a mesolimbic pathway, it uh, decreases because of D2 antagonism, which leads to the antipsychotic effect. So if you look at schizophrenia patient, this can be seen as a decrease in the psychotic symptoms. There are also lab animal-based experiment. The reason I thought I will include the component of lab animal experiment is if we go through the literature of dopamine supersensitivity, the evidence from the animal models are far more compelling and they have to be matched with uh, uh, compelling evidence from the clinical studies. So uh, the motivation for several of these proposals has primarily been anchored on definitive evidence that have come from the animal uh, research literature. So as we go late into the treatment, like I showed in the previous slide, the dopamine receptor um, density increases. So even though the antipsychotics that are able to block the baseline levels of dopamine D2 receptors with increasing density, the, uh, the antipsychotic in the same dose are unable to give uh, um, optimal antipsychotic effects. So this dopamine supersensitivity starts negating, start in start working against the antipsychotic effect that we're seeing in the early phase of the treatment. And uh, if uh, in this stage, uh, you know, when we look at the patient who has a kind of nebulous or a kind of uh, good remission, but it is not consolidated, if we are reducing the dose, this is where we will see worsening or relapse of psychosis. Importantly, it can occur with tardive dyskinesia. So this is the clinical uh, challenge that we may come across. And as I mentioned earlier, many a time it will be very difficult to delineate whether this is the course of the illness or is it because of the supersensitivity that we uh, see the worsening or relapse of symptoms. So essentially in the clinical dopamine supersensitivity stage, the rebound psychosis, tolerance, and tardive dyskinesia happen. And the tardive dyskinesia is getting emphasized uh, in most of the uh, clinical studies, mainly because the uh, major proportion of literature has come from the generation of uh, older antipsychotics. And the newer antipsychotic-related research studies are uh, emerging, and we are getting more and more um, reports especially the groups from Japan, they have been uh, reporting uh, a lot of evidence to suggest the possibility of uh, um, uh, the dopamine supersensitivity, even when we use newer antipsychotic, 
especially the ones with strong D2 antagonism and in higher dose. So this is the context uh, where uh, there is a claim that this subgroup of patient may actually be labeled as treatment resistant and then we are looking at the next steps. Now in this context, there is a very interesting uh, clinical principle uh, that is uh, laid out, which will help us to understand some of the clinical approaches uh, towards uh, preventing and treating uh, dopamine supersensitivity. So this particular um, picture, especially what we see in the right side, uh, shows the 100% upregulated dopaminergic system. So uh, the, the dopamine receptor density increase, which I uh, mentioned in the previous slide, is shown here as more number of circles. So uh, one of the postulate for clinical handling of dopamine supersensitivity is when we have a high level of receptor density, and if we see here, there is a 40% D2 receptor blockade, 60% D2 blockade, and 80% D2 blockade. 80% um, perhaps will give us antipsychotic effects, whereas if there is fluctuation in the uh, plasma levels, which in turn may reflect in the brain levels of antipsychotic medication, either because of pharmacokinetic interactions or because of uh, certain other drug-drug interactions, there could be actually fluctuation of uh, symptoms even with uh, uh, the day-to-day -day variations of uh, the plasma levels of antipsychotics. So the drug concentrations in such situation, even though they may fluctuate across the upper and lower lines of optimal therapeutic window, especially in the context of 100% upregulation, this can actually lead to suboptimal uh, control of uh, symptoms. So in patients with such a dopamine supersensitive uh, stage, um, we need to look at uh, uh, a, a way in which we can stabilize these fluctuations. So this is one of the claims uh, based on which, uh, especially the, the group by Dr. Ayo and uh, his team, uh, they were uh, experimenting the role of uh, depot antipsychotics in a subset of people with uh, uh, dopamine supersensitivity. So it has its own um, pros and cons, but there are some reports which suggest uh, the depot injections, especially if the dose is well uh, titrated, may be an option to handle the situation. Now that uh, takes us uh, to the last part of uh, my presentation, which is the clinical approach. Uh, the clinical approach towards uh, dopamine supersensitivity, in my view, could be guided by or could be kind of uh, motivated by the observation of uh, Wunderink and colleagues uh, in which uh, they reported uh, schizophrenia patients that were maintained with a reduced dose, which, of course, what is a, a reduced dose that is optimal for a particular patient uh, will uh, depend on each and every individual. But nonetheless, a global uh, statement of, uh, as we could see in this particular study, a global statement that a dose reduced group did well is something which is kind of getting emphasized again and again in the recent literature uh, of uh, approaching uh, dopamine supersensitivity. Now, as we had seen, uh, when we treat people that have first episode schizophrenia, most of the time they respond well, nearly 60 to 70 percent. What is important to notice, they most of the time require relatively lower dose of antipsychotic than what we commonly use. So this is getting uh, emphasized in the least recent literature. Uh, mm. When we want to approach uh, the treatment of schizophrenia within the clinical paradigm of avoiding supersensitivity, uh, two important components need to be uh, considered. Number one is the dose of the antipsychotic. The second one will be the duration of antipsychotic uh, at the same dose. So the more the both the factors, the higher is the likelihood of uh, supersensitivity, especially if we use a strong D2 antagonist. 
Now, this is where one has to carefully evaluate the efficacy of a molecule versus the safety, especially in the context of avoiding supersensitivity. So there has been quite a bit of discussion with respect to uh, D2 antagonist versus serotonin dopamine antagonist versus partial antagonist. There is a consensus which is emerging, which suggests the serotonin dopamine antagonist perhaps may be uh, a shade better than the strong D2 antagonist, for example, like haloperidol versus some of the newer serotonin dopamine antagonist like risperidone or olanzapine versus uh, if you go further, if a molecule has partial agonism, say for instance, aripiprazole, that may be better. But we also know that in the acute stage, uh, the clinical condition of the patient may warrant sometimes much stronger D2 antagonism, especially the uh, handle the especially to handle uh, the severe symptoms and especially in the context of uh, significant aggressions on and so forth. And also we need to kind of balance this uh, recommendation from the perspectives of su dopamine supersensitivity against the evidence grade that is available, which which suggests that the molecules uh, like risperidone, valanzapine. Um, and amisulfide are rated above uh, the partial agonist like aripiprazole. So this is something which we need to consider. And uh, the choice in case if we go towards a D2 antagonist for compelling clinical reason should also remind us to look at reducing the dose as early as possible. So to, to initiate treatment, we have to look at a minimum effective dose. Even in the context of a minimum effective dose, in case of persisting adverse effect that is linked with supersensitivity, either extrapyramidal symptoms or persisting hyperprolactinemia, there is a recommendation to consider gradual switch to a partial dopamine antagonist. Now, these principles are fairly well known, uh, you know, quite uh, familiar and quite uh, commonly recommended. Uh, perhaps one of the recent leads that is emerging is uh, how should we look at the dose reduction? Uh, you know, at, at one level, uh, when we look at reducing the dose of uh, antipsychotic, uh, usual recommendation is over a period of uh, maximum four to six weeks. But now the recommendations are going towards if we are reducing the um, uh, antipsychotic dose, each step of dose reduction should be spread over a period of three to six months. So that is the kind of uh, literature that is uh, emerging, uh, which is also informed by the fundamental neurobiological studies of uh, dopamine hypersensitivity. Uh, what these studies suggest is if the step of reduction is much faster, the antipsychotic antagonism is removed. Whereas there could be existing dopamine supersensitivity, which may be covert, uh, means they, we may not actually find some of the clinical manifestations, like say tardive dyskinesia, but the supersensitivity will be in such a stage, this dose reduction may expose the hypersensitive receptors to the existing uh, normal dopaminergic transmission, which can actually lead or can manifest as positive symptoms. So this is something which is getting emphasized uh, in recent studies. And coming to the optimal period after which we may think of uh, dose reduction, again, the guidelines are very empirical. We need more research in this area. In the context of first episode schizophrenia, about six months of uh, symptom emission should make us think uh, the next to, towards uh, gradual dose reduction. And in multi-episode schizophrenia, uh, 12 months is uh, the um, heuristic that is suggested. And uh, this is uh, something which will go a long way uh, in, in terms of avoiding uh, dopamine supersensitivity. So in this context, there is a lot of recent uh, recommendations uh, that suggest how should we approach the step-by-step -step gradual dose reduction. So what is shown here in this graph is the relationship between the haloperidol dose and D2 receptor occupancy based on the PET study literature. 
So there are two types of uh, dose reduction we generally adapt. One is the linear dose reduction. So uh, in the, the previous slide, I was mentioning about uh, the duration between each step of uh, do dose reduction. So one may want to look at three to six months uh, gap between each step. The second important component is how much will be the magnitude of dose reduction. So here there are two approaches. One is the linear approach. The second one is the hyperbolic approach. The linear approach, if we take an example of haloperidol, I start reducing the dose from say four milligram to three, three to two and two to one. So if you look at the corresponding uh, reduction in the D2 receptor occupancy, especially from the step between say one milligram and zero, that is one and then I stop, there is a big jump, like nearly 55.7% point, points of, uh, you know, the dopamine occupancy reduction. So that's, that's a huge jump. So whenever there is such a big jump, the chances of... Uh, uh, covert dopamine supersensitivity leading to uh, psychosis or re-emergence of psychosis is a possibility. So this is where there is a recommendation towards what is called as a hyperbolic uh, decreasing of uh, doses, um, which is kind of, uh, if we look at the numbers, they look a little odd in the sense like 4.4, 1.2, and then 0.5, and then 0.18. So neurobiologically, it nicely ties up with just 20-20% uh, reduction between each step in terms of D2 occupancy. So this is uh, something which is attracting more and more attention. And there are initial studies that have been uh, launched in this area. And for a good overview of this, there is a recent uh, paper that is published in Psychiatry Research, uh, which has summarized um, how the hyperbolic tapering uh, may have clinical advantages. And uh, there are uh, now what are called as available uh, tablet strips, which uh, is used in, I think, some trials in uh, Netherlands. They have used different levels of antipsychotic dosing, which are not commonly available in, in the market. So perhaps the recommendation is we need to look at dose reduction in a much more nuanced way hyperbolic fashion, but we also need to ensure those dosages are available. So this is an uh, important lead uh, that is coming up. Of course, there is a potential role for treatment with clozapine, which can mitigate uh, dopamine hyper uh, supersensitivity, especially through the glutamatergic mechanism. There are certain molecules like quetiapine, aripiprazole, blonanserin, and valproate, which have been recommended uh, uh, to have the potential for preventing. And uh, if we face a dopamine supersensitivity situation, uh, uh, there is a role for ECT. There are selected patients where we have found ECT to be helpful uh, in our setup. And as I mentioned in the initial uh, one of the slides, there are reports of long-acting injectable uh, being beneficial. So this is a controversial area because when we use a uh, depot injection, it also means that we are kind of uh, blocking the D2 receptor consistently for a longer period. The, the nuanced uh, component is what will be the right level of D2 receptor blockage. So that is something which uh, we need to think through. Very recently, there is a report on uh, brexpiprazole, uh, perhaps maybe better than aripiprazole. Uh, in handling dopamine supersensitivity psychosis. And also there is a recommendation for using glutamatergic agents. So it, there are many glutamatergic agents which are available, uh, say starting from uh, lamotrigine to memantin, so on and so forth. So there is a potential role, especially uh, because if you look at one of the biological um, study in molecular uh, psychiatry, uh, they have implicated a role for glutamatergic abnormality to underlie uh, dopamine supersensitivity. Of course, there is also a critique. Uh, uh, you know, this is uh, the last slide I have where uh, there are people uh, that claim uh, perhaps dopamine supersensitivity um, is kind of uh, uh, more emphasized or, uh, or kind of uh, uh, inflated than what it is real. 
mainly because uh, we have compelling uh, studies that come from animal models, but we need much more refined clinical neurobiological studies in uh, uh, human patients uh, where neuro adaptations that lead to dopamine supersensitive state uh, should be uh, you know, uh, clearly demonstrated. So that is something which uh, is a claim, but there are a group of researchers that have been carefully looking for uh, dopamine supersensitivity and uh, a set of researchers, they report that it is a clinically important phenomena versus there is another group of researchers who are also looking for much more uh, neurobiologically anchored evidence that can guide our future treatment protocol. So with this, I will just uh, end with uh, the uh, summary points that I wanted to communicate. While dopamine supersensitivity may, may make us think uh, whether antipsychotics uh, may do more harm than good, um, I would like to reiterate antipsychotics are the mainstay treatment for schizophrenia. Perhaps it is how we use them, how we prescribe them, and how we match them for an individual patient makes all the difference. So in this context, supersensitivity psychosis is a re-emerging concept, uh, especially given the recent longer-term prospective studies. And also, there has been a quest for optimality of treatment duration and uh, defining uh, people with schizophrenia that require longer-term antipsychotic medication. Uh, the clinical neurobiology of schizophrenia symptoms I briefly touched upon, emphasizing the centrality of dopamine, and then introduced the dopamine supersensitivity psychosis with some of the recent uh, definition, and then alluded to the heuristics and some kind of empirical approach uh, in uh, clinically um, um, handling this, and ended with a critique that emphasized the need for systematic studies. So with this, I will uh, stop and uh, I thank again for this opportunity and I look forward to further interaction and learning in the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for a, such a erudite presentation. So uh, now I invite the chairpersons for their opening remarks. Right. Thank you, sir. A very, very lucid presentation. But because a controversial topic, there are a lot of things that... Uh, we need to understand because uh, psychosis means this is uh, often we cannot accept this term that a patient is on antipsychotics, develop a flare of psychosis. And uh, when we are giving him and him or her an antipsychotic, we often try to see that uh, what has caused this emergence of psychosis. So we try to find out whether there's a compliance issue or whether there is uh, some stressor that has precipitated the psychosis or there is something else, or maybe we have make a wrong diagnosis at the initial time, and uh, maybe the cycles have flared up because of that. So um, I think always tricky to uh, catch hold of this kind of diagnosis uh, when a patient was absolutely okay with antipsychotics for a longer time, and then suddenly developed a flare of psychosis. Now, sir, a few interesting things which I have read in a few of the case reports uh, published. Uh, one report said, like, um, there can be, emergence of new onset of psychosis, like uh, suppose a patient of schizophrenia who was having auditory hallucination and uh, never experienced a thought phenomenon or a mate phenomenon, uh, suddenly developed a mate phenomenon or a, a kind of thought phenomenon or a control phenomenon, which was not there previously. This is one, can it happen? Like the psychosis can change and then make the things much more worse. Uh, another second thing is like, whether um, kind of, uh, suppose a patient who is uh, not schizophrenia, suppose, suppose a delusional disorder, which is also on a stable dose of antipsychotics, develop a schizophrenia-like psychosis, uh, which may be a DSP or uh, we don't know. Or maybe uh, sometimes it can be diagnosed as a, as a shift of diagnosis from delusional disorder to schizophrenia. So in this uh, both uh, context, uh, what what a clinician should think and how we should approach the case. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. I think uh, this is an important point. I, I missed uh, mentioning the change in the phenomenology of uh, the psychosis uh, that is described in the context of dopamine supersensitivity. There is an emphasis on, as you pointed out, the Schneiderian festering symptoms, uh, mm. which uh, perhaps was uh, would not have been seen uh, till then in the course of uh, schizophrenia. 
Now, so such symptom uh, changes have also been uh, mentioned as a pointer towards uh, the uh, presence of uh, um, super sensitivity. And so in that context, actually, uh, when uh, people debate between uh, the whether the withdrawal of antipsychotics by themselves can lead to psychotic symptoms, it is very difficult to differentiate it from a natural progression or a natural evolution of the symptoms versus uh, whether this is due to some kind of additional hyperdopaminergic state. So one uh, group of uh, um, observations, uh, which uh, you know, which uh, uh, some of the manuscript cites, there are instances where people that do not have any psychiatric history neither they had uh, any psychosis symptom, but were treated with dopamine antagonists, for instance, uh, metoclopramide or dopamiridone. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. These are very few case reports. When these uh, medications were given in people for other uh, medical uh, indications, and when these molecules, after being given for a relatively longer period, somewhere between three to six months, when it is removed, these people, there are reports of uh, persons developing psychotic symptoms. So, which again, these case reports claim these are not commonly reported, though it may be much more common. People don't, because many a time it might be self remitting. So, that's why they don't report. So, this is one point I thought I should mention, especially uh, uh, you um, alluding to the change in the phenomenology. So, there are reports of de novo psychotic symptoms that happen when people are treated with D2 antagonists for indications other than psychosis. There are also uh, psychiatric uh, conditions which did not show psychotic symptoms. For instance, it could be, um, uh, you know, um, a mental subnormality for the behavioral disturbances, antipsychotics were used for a long time. And then when the medications were removed for the first time, psychotic symptoms emerge. So these are certain reports which suggest that we need to perhaps think carefully uh, when we use D2 antagonists for longer time. And of course, as you pointed out, uh, change in the symptom presentation with an emphasis on especially Schneiderian first rank symptom is uh, given as one of the pointers towards dopamine super sensitivity. Yeah, th thanks for pointing that out. Nice. Bishop, you have something to introduce? Thank you, sir, uh, for this uh, nice presentation. We, am I audible? Yes, yes. Uh, sir, thank you, sir, for this nice presentation. And uh, we learned uh, regarding the choice of uh, antipsychotics, particularly in super sensitivity scenarios, the use of partial D2 agonist, the use of clozapine, and uh, the hyperbolic approach of re dose reduction and the duration. There were uh, two questions actually. What uh, when during the literature review, when we were uh, writing that, uh, we were going through that study of 10 patients. Uh, uh, like uh, the Charnard's group, they described that uh, super sensitivity psychosis is uh, evident only uh, when we reduce the dose or we switch the class of antipsychotics. But later on, uh, I, so I'm just forgetting the group. I think it's Fallon or, uh, Fallon or somebody. Fallon, yeah. Yes, uh, Fallon. They, Fallon, they describe that even uh, patients who are uh, on stable dose of antipsychotics, so we don't need to reduce the dose or we, we don't need to switch. Even patients who are on stable dose of antipsychotics, they also can develop tolerance towards the usual dose and uh, they can also present with rebound psychosis along with tardive phenomenon. So the, my question is, what is your thought regarding this? Is it related to the dose reduction? the first concept of dose reduction, or it can happen as a natural course uh, on treatment with any uh, D2 blocker. And the second question is uh, regarding the use of uh, clozapine in treatment resistance uh, skin, uh, schizophrenia and uh, propermine supersensitivity. Uh, like I had read few reports from the Professor Grover uh, where uh, they had also reported uh, super sensitive psychosis even who patients who are on clozapine. So, like, uh, it will be a difficult situation anyway. 
so what will be your treatment approach like uh, what should be we do to the clozapine dose or the levels and should we go with any kind of combination or augmentation strategies in that scene right right thanks thanks for those uh, questions sir i think uh, with respect to the first question you alluded to two scenarios first one is the the choinard's uh, description which is the classical one we reduce the dose and then the uh, symptoms recur or relapse uh, in a much severe way whereas we also come across a clinical situation uh, in uh, which when especially patients are on relatively higher dose of antipsychotics for longer time uh, there is uh, there is the observation of breakthrough episode um, so this is perhaps uh, the group of patient which uh, the fallon and colleagues uh, reported uh, in in that context what is uh, hypothesized is that um, because of uh, higher level of d2 antagonism over the course of 3 to 4 months usually the super sensitivity exceeds the threshold so that even the higher dose of antipsychotic could not block the available or the increased amount of uh, uh, d2 receptor either the density is more or there is also a proposal that uh, the high affinity receptors uh, uh, might be facilitated in such situation. So it, it essentially uh, points to the clinical principle that uh, if we use a much higher dose for longer time, there could be a breakthrough episode which may happen uh, even though the person is on regular medication. So uh, in the second context, I would expect it always to happen with the higher end of the dose. Coming to the second question that you asked with respect to the uh, do dopamine uh, supersensitivity, even in the context of clozapine, usually this will be observed in a later stage of uh, treatment where already dopamine supersensitivity has settled in to the extent that uh, even some unique molecule like clozapine, uh, you know, in clozapine's uh, uh, scenario, apart from its uh, the dopaminergic mechanism, there is a lot of recent evidence to suggest glutamatergic modulation may also play a role. And more recent uh, uh, literature, the one which is published in Molecular Psychiatry, suggests there could be glutamatergic component to the dopamine supersensitivity. Now, even if a molecule like clozapine is unable to handle that, there are recommendations uh, to use um, mood stabilizers. Uh, if if the clinical condition is not very acute, you know, the recommendation is something like valproate. Um, that is one option. Suppose if the clinical condition is extremely acute, one can look at uh, um, electroconvulsive therapy. So, and then uh, come back to adding some of these uh, molecules. There was one patient where we had an experience of uh, uh, similar challenging clinical situation where we found clozapine to be quite difficult to handle because it 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 didn't uh, solve the super sensitivity. But over the course of time, we were able to handle that patient with uh, a lower dose of aripiprazole. So, but the transition period was extremely. Uh, critical. And that is a situation one may want to use either mood stabilizer. There is also an option of, apart from ECT, higher doses of uh, benzodiazepines. So. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sir. Ali, we can open the chat box and we can ask yeah, questions. Yeah. I have a few questions. Sir, sir, before that, a few silly questions, because to, just to put the things in perspective. So, first question is uh, dopamine super sensitivity, is it a thing? Is it actually there? Um, so, so if someone asks, someone says to me that uh, no, what you are saying is not correct. So, how do I uh, argue that it could be a thing? It is a thing, or how much? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Fact, fact versus fiction. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So, the, 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 the you know, I think more compelling, um, um, you know, evidence would be like Dino onset of psychosis when we use D two antagonists. In, like I gave the example of you know, uh, um, uh, domperidone and other molecules, which suggest it could be a possibility, number one. Number two, uh, we, we know that when we uh, treat people with higher dose of uh, antipsychotics and when the dose reduction happens, 
we also see worsening of psychotic symptoms along with dyskinesia. So that is something which should kind of make us to think towards the presence of dopamine supersensitivity. So this is something which would not have been present in the initial stages, which is a, a de novo occurrence uh, after the dose reduction, especially withdrawal emergent dyskinesia, if it is accompanied by uh, worsening or new onset or newer phenomenology, that should be another uh, you know evidence towards thinking in this direction. Okay. Sir, another slightly unrelated question. We can avoid it if it is not a part of this thing. So, so are we, uh, because many in many discussions, it was there that dopamine only is not responsible for psychosis. Many other things are also there. Yes. So by this, uh, uh, what we're trying to say, only dopamine is responsible for psychosis? Yeah, so so the, so that's a, that's a very important question. So when we are looking at uh, uh, the neurotransmitter basis, so if we are seeing from the perspectives of glutamate and GABA, it has to act through the dopaminergic uh, transmission. So that is the predominant uh, uh, neurobiology that is implicated in schizophrenia. There are also uh, abnormalities which may involve serotonergic system and also cholinergic system. But if we are looking at positive symptoms, it is predominantly the serotonergic system. Uh, but the contribution is more modulatory than direct in the context of schizophrenia. So that is why this is another evidence to support uh, dopamine supersensitivity, mainly because uh, there are credible evidence to suggest when we use serotonin and dopamine modulation, the chances of dopamine supersensitivity is less. So also, as you rightly pointed out, uh, you know, uh, we cannot ascribe the super sensitivity only to dopamine. And that is precisely the reason I put the title as super sensitivity psychosis and not as dopamine super sensitivity, but the predominant anchor is dopamine. Okay. Okay. So, sir, uh, suppose uh, we have 100 patients of psychosis. So, in how many persons can we expect this? Yeah, uh, the available literature suggests um, as much as up to about 30% as we treat. These are people that are treated who are kind of uh, well into the treatment, initial few months to few years of treatment. So the prevalence could be as high as about 30%. Okay, so, so the treatment is progressing, the compliance is okay, and suddenly the person is having exacerbation yes. with... Uh, possibility of TD. So then we that start is, thinking on terms of... Yes, yes. That is one condition. Second is even with minimal dose reduction, uh, especially relatively higher dose of antipsychotic, we see a disproportionate increase in the uh, worsening of the symptoms. Okay. So sir, what profile of psychosis patients, this, this approximately 30%, what is their profile? How are they different from the rest Two third. How can we identify beforehand if this person might be having uh, this uh, super sensitivity later on? Oh, excellent question. So, so this these are the group of patients that will respond very well to antipsychotics. So once we start treating, we see improvement very fast in them, and these are the patients that remit. Um, uh, so, uh, so the approach will be like if 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 we see people that are responding faster, we need to rethink. The initial stabilizing dose of antipsychotic. We need to start thinking whether in the initial stages itself, whether they need higher dose or we should kind of keep them at a relatively lower dose. So typically people that go towards super sensitivity are the ones who are very good responders. Okay. So suppose a person is responding, then I have to keep a point in mind that we need to go for in, uh, going for early dose reduction. Uh, 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 rather than early dose reduction, I would say that uh, when we build the dose itself, we have to be gradual, uh, you know, at least in the initial few days, if there are no acute and uh, compelling psychiatric emergencies. Uh, the suggestion is one may want to use uh, molecules like benzodiazepine for the initial couple of weeks and then uh, think about increasing the antipsychotics further. So we can probably wean off the adjuvant molecules quicker. The, the crux is to keep the dose of antipsychotic as much lower as possible. And in case if we kind of uh, 
see a good clinical response. Say we, I, I just see a patient who shows uh, significant and florid hallucinations and delusions. I just give treatment recommendation for uh, risperidone up to four milligram, which is the usual dose. Three weeks later, the person comes back, absolutely no symptoms, but has, uh, you know, uh, striking extrapyramidal symptom, which I do not generally see with uh, four milligram. Then I would start thinking in terms of the initial stabilization dose will be somewhere at three. So, so this is what uh, I would think, sir. Sir, and in uh, you said months to years. So, when to when do we expect this in a course of treatment? Uh, when when this supersensitive is happening? The the trajectory usually develops after about minimum three to four months of treatment. So that's why the initial stabilization dose itself, if we are kind of keeping it at the lower end, then that is an important uh, avenue to avoid supersensitivity. Okay. Okay, sir. So, uh, so. Uh, what are the you said benzodiazepines are one add-on and valproate also can be used there we can use valproate yes okay uh, sir many patients uh, when we add antidepressants uh, suppose ssris so they are having long standing psychosis and there is good functional improvement in them so uh, is it related somewhere here or it is a separate matter um, I would uh, think it is uh, different. Uh, perhaps uh, these patients uh, uh, may be having uh, coexistent depressive symptoms, which could be a post-psychotic, or uh, the beneficial effects that we observe could be uh, the uh, due to the reduction in the negative symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. Overall, long-term prognosis is better, is worse, or is equal to the others? Okay, so once super sensitivity sets in, if we don't identify it, it can actually lead to a spiraling uh, course, uh, which may lead to more, like each time whenever there is a super sensitivity and then it leads to a relapse, uh, many a time we may end up with using much higher dose of uh, antipsychotic and uh, it can, it, if, if it is not identified, it will uh, lead to a much uh, deteriorating uh, course. Um, so the earlier we identify this possibility, and then handle it, uh, you know, through different ways, um, especially keeping in mind that this is somebody who is more sensitive to D2 antagonism. Uh, there, is a, there is a window uh, where we can kind of alter the course. And these are uh, the possibilities which I uh, think of. And actually, they need careful clinical, uh, uh, you know, research. Absolutely, absolutely, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, so, Kanto, we can take the questions in the chat box now. Right, right. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot for those uh, really insightful and thought-provoking questions. That I, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So there are some some questions in the chat box. So, if we can, Dr. Sukanto uh, boss can help yeah, me there. Uh, there is I'll start from the. I'll start from the beginning. Just a minute. Does V mat V M A T T ah. inhibitors help in? Dopamine sensitivity, super sensitivity. We we met two oh, inhibitors. Yeah, 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 they, yeah. They they may help to extent, you know, to some extent in terms of. So this is this is a group of molecule which have not been adequately examined. There is a potential it may help if you are kind of uh, uh, looking at uh, the equivalence with respect to the tardive dyskinesia. But I'm not aware of any study that has examined this. Maybe if, if uh, the colleague that has asked this question, if uh, um, they have an idea, maybe I'll be happy to learn. Okay. Next two, three questions, I think Sir has answered only. Like we have to go, uh, go at a low dose for long-term treatment and uh, close up in is useful. Uh, okay. Another one they have asked is a patient think, developed oculogyric crisis and auditory hallucination at the same time. So can it be considered as a super sensitivity or a tardive or acute dystonia like as a part of the symptom? Yeah, I think this is a very good question. So oculogyric crisis is one of the tardive movement disorder, which again uh, suggests the possibility, especially if it co-occurs with... Uh, uh, worsening of uh, psychotic symptoms, uh, it's highly likely to be supersensitive. I think uh, 
uh, this is something again has to be handled with the same principles. And sir, uh, sir, I would like to share uh, one of our experience. Yes, sir. Like, uh, the same uh, thing. This uh, in this ten patients, whatever we have described, this is published in British Journal of Clinical Pharmacology, uh, which Sri Raj uh, we had published that. So we had basically this group of patients only who presented with dystonia. Uh, they presented with paroxysmal uh, ocular dystonia or truncal dystonia. Along with that, there were psychotic exacerbations. Uh, so like uh, two things were the psychotic exacerbation was very clear. And there were some dyskinetic, uh, there were predominant dystonia rather than dyskinesis. In one or two patients, we had some dyskinetic movements as well in terms of blepharospasm and some dyskinetic movements, but predominant the picture was dystonia. Actually, we initially uh, conceptualized this in terms of dopamine supersensitivity and we uh, it was reviewed by, our paper was reviewed by Fallon, but their context was uh, because... Uh, it was very episodic in presentation, paroxysm smell in presentation. So they clearly deferred and told that, no, this is something else. Uh, this is not super sensitivity. Super sensitivities uh, cannot occur in paroxysm. So we were also in a doubt, although logically it was looking something like that. So, sir, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think this is a very nuanced point. So uh, the, the, if, you, if you remember two, three slides which I showed where... Sometimes the fluctuations of the antipsychotic levels uh, within the uh, uh, you know within the upper and lower bound, uh, especially in patients that have highly supersensitive condition, if the antipsychotic level goes towards the lower bound, that is where we will get this kind of uh, phenomena where there will be a proximal uh, movement associated with worsening of uh, psychotic symptoms. So this is a paper uh, which was published in Journal of Clinical Psychopharmacology. This is a concept uh, by uh, Dr. Io and colleagues, uh, you know, that actually uh, nicely ties with your uh, clinical observations, sir. I I'm happy to share that paper, which will, uh, which will give. And based on that, they have also done some treatment trials and uh, they have uh, reported some benefits. So I would think uh, this particular uh, proposal uh, closely aligns with your uh, clinical Thank observation. You. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, so next question is also interesting, like whether this clinical approach or super sensitive psychosis holds whether it's a schizophrenia versus schizoaffective versus non-organic uh, psychosis, course, different course, whether it holds good for everyone or it's only for schizophrenia with a particular kind of course. Mm. I would think it holds, it should hold good for any other condition, although most of the research is schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, right. Yeah. Have you seen it in bipolar patients, sir? Bipolar with psychosis, like? Um, actually, if, uh, this, this is a review uh, published in Schizophrenia Bulletin, in mm -hmm. which uh, to support the concept of dopamine supersensitivity, uh, especially with an observation that new onset psychotic symptoms occurring in, in, in psychiatric condition where there was no psychotic symptoms. So they have, uh, re they have um, uh, summarized bipolar disorder cases that initially did not have psychotic symptoms uh, mm. in the course till the patients were treated with antipsychotics. And once after the subsequent episode in which antipsychotic was given, and the antipsychotic was uh, kind of removed or kind of taken out, the, the patient developed psychosis. Yeah, so, exactly. yeah, uh, thanks for this in important question. So, uh, so this is a paper that was published by Dr. Horowitz and the colleagues. I think it's an open access publication in Schizophrenia Bulletin, which summarizes uh, the relevant clinical points. So, which oh. means it is possible in a disorders like uh, like you rightly predicted, it, it's possible, sir. Uh, next one is, how will you differentiate treatment resistance schizophrenia from DSS? Yes. Um, like if, if uh, it is a treatment resistance biologically uh, without the confounds of uh, dopamine supersensitivity, we would expect the resistance right from the initial uh, phase of the illness. Like if the person comes and uh, starts uh, uh, receiving the treatment, uh, even with a very short duration of uh, psychosis, there will be no response. So this is the common uh, treatment resistance trajectory. Whereas 
if there could have been a confirmed of dopamine supersensitivity, one would expect a relapsing and remitting and relapsing course. That is, there will be good response in the initial phase. And if the supersensitivity is not picked up, I would expect the course to be more and more relapsing and leading yes. towards treatment resistance. Right, right, right. Definitely, sir. I think these are very important clinical pearls that you are saying, like um, relapsing, yes. remitting course and occurrence of uh, tardive dyskinesia or an acute uh, oculogrial crisis with exacerbation of psychosis will definitely strike our mind that whether we are dealing with super sensitive psychosis. Another question, sir, that also is interesting, like suppose a patient was on clozapine and developed this kind of symptoms, uh, or no, he was on clozapine and then it was titrated with quetiapine. And then he developed this kind of symptoms. Now uh, he was again uh, tried with clozapine and he's showing a resistance to that. Does it happen with uh, super sensitive yes. psychosis? Like so rechallenge once, and all like that concept. Uh, yeah. uh, I think again, this is a very challenging clinical situation. And it also emphasizes one other important clinical point. Once the super sensitivity is established, uh, while clozapine is a good option, uh, mm -hmm. though one may consider quetiapine also weak D2 um, molecule, we can look at it. The recommendation is quetiapine would not help. Uh, mainly because quetiapine is not uh, known to have the differential glutamatergic modulatory capacity. So if there is a patient who is already resistant to clozapine and has features of dopamine supersensitivity or supersensitivity psychosis, as uh, Dr. Alim pointed out, no, I should probably use the term supersensitivity psychosis because it has multiple neurotransmitter contribution. Um, there is a clear uh, suggestion that quetiapine wouldn't help. So in such challenging clinical situation, I would probably think in terms of using electroconvulsive therapy to begin with, or there are also recommendations to use other neuromodulatory uh, treatments like, uh, these are again proposals, uh, either transcranial magnetic stimulation or transcranial direct current stimulation. So I would probably go for neuromodulatory approaches. And as symptoms uh, resolve, I will perhaps look at a lower dose of um, uh, molecules like aripiprazole, uh, very, very low dose to begin with, perhaps supplement it with uh, uh, certain mood stabilizers, uh, like say, for instance, valproate or even low dose lamotrigin. So that would be the line which I would be thinking. This is an, ex this is an extremely challenging clinical uh, situation, which uh, one of the colleagues pointed out here. Yeah. But the bottom line is, quetiapine, uh, I wouldn't predict to help, uh, mainly because um, you know, what happens when we use quetiapine is there is already a severe supersensitive state. We are giving a weak uh, D2 uh, uh, binding molecule. So it's going to keep a lot of dopamine receptors open. So naturally, the psychotic symptoms wouldn't uh, reduce. Though I may put it in a simple way, these are all some kind of uh, relatively reductionistic views which many a time may align with clinical situation, but it is much more complex. Like there could be many other neurotransmitters that may be influencing. Sir, so if we add THP, what will happen to it? Um, uh, if we add uh, uh, THP, like um, um, I, um, sorry, I, I, I can't immediately answer uh, that question. Uh, because uh, from what I have uh, learned, I couldn't think of any cholinergic uh, modulation uh, in the whole uh, picture. Um, though there are reports of clozapine resistant patients improving with uh, cholinergic augmentation, say for instance, uh, donabism. So in, in that context, number one. Number two, also our, our clinical observation that Anticholinergics generally will worsen tardive dyskinesia. I would expect the supersensitivity state to worsen, but I have not read anything. It is just a, a kind of guess I am uh, making. Yeah. And sir, uh, Dr. Sukanto, yeah. the, the question that was there in the chat box, I have an exact same patient who has consulted me, then went to many places, then again came back. He has oculogry crisis and at the same time he starts murmuring and muttering and hallucinating. So he's on clozapine. Now the dose limiting factor, uh, I have tried to add uh, this long acting benzodiazepine with some response. There is some response, but again, the sedation, it becomes dose limiting. 
Mm -hmm. So that is one thing. So I think I will try valproate in it. So maybe right. uh, can help the patient. <laughs> yeah. Uh... Yeah, in such patients, uh, we have again tried similar things. Uh, the, uh, if, especially if it is an oclogairic crisis, and if it comes, um, e many a time we find it to come in the later part of the day, and especially if you are giving something like a close-up in a say, single uh, dose, we know the half-life is about 12 hours, so the later afternoon and evening, there could be a trough level. So there are occasions where a split dose of clozapine, like morning adding some 25 milligram has helped. But again, in some of the patients that didn't, clonazepam has helped many a time. Uh, and also um, uh, another important cl clinical learning I had was many a time I also find these patients to be more susceptible to a uh, stressful situation or perceived stressful situation. It could be a socially anxiety-provoking situation. So in such patients, uh, uh, it is known that the dopamine supersensitivity also increases their stress reactivity. So in occasional patients, I have found add-on uh, propranolol to help, not directly, but through the through kind of reducing their um, you know, anxiety uh, propensity. Okay, okay. And so the I other would... molecule I would think of would be gabapentin. Okay. Okay, so I think propnol I have already added, but he's very uh, sedation becomes the dose limiting. Clozapine okay. can be increased, so benzodiazepine cannot be. So maybe so gabapin and valproate may be two options that could be worth a try in this. Okay. Um, yeah, of course, a low dose of lamotrigine is also another option we can explore, sir. Keep especially since sedation is a challenge that you are mentioning. I'll give you the feedback when the patient comes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sir. So basically, I, I one of the reason I thought of choosing this topic is to learn. I have learned so many new points uh, through the questions, and so I think mm -hmm. we should kind of look at all these uh, experiences. Maybe we need to look at doing some kind of um, clinical records of our experiences and trying to collect maybe through one of the IPS studies or something like that. We should think, sir. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I think so more or less we have covered. Our other questions are almost same. Mm -hmm. Potassium channel modulators in treatment of skin. Uh, I, I have no idea. Potassium channel modulators. No, I I don't of... have any idea about it, 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 sir. We are not actually talking about treatment of schizophrenia, sir. Yeah, right, right, right. In case of, uh, in case of super sensitivity psychosis, is there preponderance of positive versus negative symptoms? More of positive symptoms. More of positive. That sir has told more of positive symptoms. So it's predominantly positive symptoms, sir. The negative symptoms can at the most be secondary. Okay. I think uh, we have uh, had a lot of good learning points, like yes. patient to respond very first, very early. We should have a caution in that, like the patient profile that you're talking about. And yes. then the, definitely when there is tardive dyskinesia with uh, or dystonia, uh, with uh, psychosis, emergence of psychosis, then we could we can have a uh, we can think of super sensitive psychosis, or there is a withdrawal and there is a flare of psychosis. Uh, yeah. So these are the few points that definitely will help us uh, to identify. Because uh, as Sir told, the course becomes uh, difficult. Then. Uh, the prognosis becomes difficult when there is a super sensitive psychosis and we have not identified and if given more of suppose and typical antipsychotic to treat the person because he has developed a flare of psychosis. So other uh, treatment modalities, like if it's very severe ECTs or other what we have discussed, valproate, lamotrigine, benzodiazepine, all this can be used rather than uh, thinking of treating like an acute psychotic phase. I think that is one uh, very good learning experience. And anything else, Bishra? Before we wind up, I think it's already 9.35. I think that was the time. I just missed the time <laughs> to engross. Dr. Biswa, you need to unmute. Yeah. So, like, uh, we learned uh, a lot of things. Uh, uh, like, uh, many, many, actually, it added a lot of things to what uh, uh, we, I, I was basically searching for a few answers, which I got uh, through Sir's presentation. The only one observation I will tell you in uh, our group of patients, what we had seen, uh, you can, Alim, you can see it and uh, you can also try it in your patient and see. 
in our patient who had that par this paradoxical uh, ocular dystonia along with uh, psychosis, uh, they didn't respond to intravenous finergan. Uh, that was something which was very, uh, th there is, that, that is a point when we started thinking what we are dealing with. And it was looking more like a versive seizure. A patient had dystonia, ocular dystonia and was lost and was continuously muttering and uh, did not respond to Finergan. We consistently saw this in three, four patients. And interestingly, I had a discussion with Sriraj also. He also told that when he was in Agra, he had seen some similar patient who had responded, acute episode response well to benzodiazepines. And uh, throughout, we had around many patients, I think 15 to 20 patients, acute episodes. Uh, uh, if somebody is uh, not comfortable giving injectable, uh, one to two milligrams of lorazepam uh, does wonderful uh, to resolve the acute episodes. And uh, long term, yes, uh, as I told, the use of, uh, because it's not only dopamine, it's GABA and glutamate and free radicals are also implicated. So the use of uh, uh, BOMT inhibitors uh, can be considered and the use of uh, Valproate, uh, clozapine, along with valproate, lamotrigin are definitely options which should be explored. It was a great learning experience uh, from you, sir, and uh, nice. Uh, uh, it was a very good experience overall. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sukanta, sir, and Alim also uh, Thank for you. Thank you. wonderful Thank lectures. You. Over Thank to you, the board. Uh, yeah, Tufan Pati, sir. Tufan, sir, for, sir, sir your ex you have maximum experience in using dopamine agonist amongst all the panelists. Yeah. <laughs> so, so wanted to know your experience in this regard and then you sir, you have to say what of thanks because amrit has some emergency and he is to attend yeah, amrit is here but he is busy yeah. otherwise you can see him. so i shall propose the vote of thanks instead of amrit if he's not available in that point of time that is true i have more than 40 years of experience in jacket and uh, when I started practicing, my teacher was Dr. Madhar Das, who was totally mud slave oriented, 99.9%. Translating his mud slave observations into state like Odisha, where there are hardly five to six psychiatrists. It was a different challenge and it was a learning atmosphere, how people really behave with the patient. Number one, I shall take how people really behave with a patient when the patient develops a symptom, which today we can call it a super sensitive it is psychosis. We told it is TD. That is the commonest problem. That alienates the patient from the family members. They start thinking these doctors, because doctors are very few, cannot do anything. They have worsened the patient after all. They reduce the medicine. That is why it has come. And you go back to heighten the medicine, it does not come. The patient's uh, abnormal movement, they try to treat with local doctors, try to treat with trihexapenidyl. All the medicines that are available, procyclidine, and they again worsens. And the patient stops coming. And the second observation I will try to say, these features are also common as the patient grows up. All of us know, after a particular age, from the pre senile age, there is a gross high degree of comorbidity. The patients also take medicines for the comorbid conditions. And some comorbid comorbidities make it a person more so susceptible to develop super sensitivity reactions. And maybe we ignore them. How we try to manage, it has to be along with the treatment for the comorbidities. On average, exact statistics is there, but on, on average in my practice, patients beyond 60 years, at least 60% of them have comorbidities, either two or three of the following, hypertension, diabetes, arthritis, and asthma. I, two of them, they have it. If we explore, if you see the records, they have it. So that creates a confusion. But 
who is viewing in this way, one has to suspect and one has to know how to taper the medicine and one has to take the family members into confidence. Family education is most important because we are not the only doctors that we see the patients. Every patient is also seen by all the relatives. Every patient is also seen by the beetles of gossip mongers. If the patient does not improve as they expect. We work in that atmosphere. Those who work in community, we work in that atmosphere. Every prescription is to, going to be Googled if the patient has educated for beyond 15 years. Every prescription has to be going to be discussed in the uh, chat group of theirs in the piece of Senuhe. And every person is going to comment for a hard experience. And we have to see that it has to be done. Patient family education, psychoeducation is most important in this crucial bands. So this is my submission, but today's talk has been quite enriching. Thank you, Dr. Venkat. I think you should expand your studies to take these things into your heart, the effect of comorbidities. This comorbidities increase the propensity of the supersensitivity psychosis, right? To which degree they do? When we have a super sensitivity related symptom, can we totally attribute it to the medicine we are giving? Or it has been increased because of the presence of one other medicine for a longer time? Because the ultimate substrate is our chemical system in the body. We tell it by any name, it was they work together. Thank you very much, Dr. Venkat, and thank you, Dr. Sukanto, for your rich inputs. Bisho, whom I know since his childhood. Thank you, Bisho, if you are here. And thanks, Dr. Thank Alim. Thank you very much, Dr. Alim, for nicely moderating, even in the absence of Dr. Amrit, who are categorically told me that I will be around, I will, I will be logging in, but I cannot participate. He is having a family bunch. And just after this meeting, I am also expected to be there. And Thanks all the audience, thanks the Torrent Group. It was a highly enriching topic and it is enlightening. You can understand your presence as you move on much better than. But there should be a reflexive prolongation of this time. And I think all the questions that has been to you, you can take it and make a representation. This is a critical issue. Yes. Sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Thank you, sir. I think there were uh, more than uh, 250 to between 250 to 300 logins were there. Peak of around 190 was there. So a huge audience speaks about the speaker that is here. <laughs> very, very respected persons. So my thank you, sir. Very actually a learning experience and actually it might change the way I practice. So thank you so much. Thank you thank so you. much. Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, closing, the, closing the meeting now, sir, with your permission. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you.